everybody, it's Ryan here again with our 93rd mnemonic in the awesome discipline of internal medicine. I bring warm greetings in the precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope you all guys are all well, especially after the recent rains we've been having here in KZM. All right, so today it's my joy to be speaking about the 12 A's of ankylosing spondylitis, all right? Uh, but first up, a couple of dead jokes as usual. What do you call a crocodile showing off his spine flexibility on the internet? You call him reptile disc function. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, a man once went into a bookstore and complained, I bought this book from you yesterday entitled Cowards in History, and all the pages fell out. To this, the sales assistant said, oh, that's because uh, it has no spine. Okay, guys. So, you know, this being Passion Week, I thought I could encourage you from the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, which basically encapsulates the gospel. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall inherit everlasting life. Then verse 17 goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. Amen. All right. So let's talk about the 12 A's of ankylosing uh, spondylitis. As you know, ankylosing spondylitis is one of the four seronegative spondyloarthropathies that we spoke of in yesterday's mnemonic. Uh, all right. So it classically involves the spine and you have peripheral arthritis as well. And remember, the features of all the seronegative spondyloarthropathies is beads, backache, enthesopathy, peripheral arthritis, dactylitis and spinal involvement, all right? So E speaks to peripheral arthritis, it can also be atlantoaxial subluxation, A also stands for anterior uveitis, apical lung fibrosis, aortic regurgitation, that's because of involvement of the aortic root. They also have aortitis, which keeps company together with AR, amyloidosis, all right, AV conduction defects, Achilles tendinitis, which happens sometimes together with plantar fasciitis, cord equina syndrome because of spinal cord compression, and IgA nephropathy. So what are the important clinical features in someone who has ankylosing spondylitis? So salient features in history is back stiffness and back pain. Often classically worse in the morning, it improves on exercise and worsens at rest. So it's a typical inflammatory uh, pain. And then we also have symptoms in the peripheral joints up to 40%, particularly the shoulders and knees. The onset of symptoms is typically insidious and usually in the third to fourth decade of life. And we mentioned the extra articular manifestations. So it's good to inquire about these. Do your eyes ever become red, which as we know speaks to anterior uveitis? Do you have diarrhea, which speaks to GI involvement, history of aortic regurgitation, and lung fibrosis, which tends to be worse in smokers. On examination, what you may notice is the classical question mark posture, which is as a result of a loss of lumbar lordosis. You have fixed kyphoscoliosis of the thoracic spine with compensatory extension of the cervical spine. You may also observe the, the protuberant abdomen. So at this point, you want to ask the patient to look to either side and note if the whole body turns. Okay, you also want to examine the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spines, remembering that C-spine involvement occurs later in disease and results in pain and crepitus on neck movement. You want to measure the occiput-to-wall distance, which refers to inability to make contact when the heel and back are against the wall, which indicates upper thoracic and cervical limitation. Then Schober's test we spoke about in yesterday's video. Uh, for more information, you can have a look at my video on the serenegative spondyl arthropathies. The finger-to-flow distance as well is simply indicator, but is less reliable because good hip movement may actually compensate for back limitation. Examine for distal arthritis, which occurs in up to 30% of patients and may precede the onset of back symptoms. Small joints of the hands and feet are rarely affected. And to measure the chest expansion with a tape less than 5 centimeters is suggestive of costal vertebral involvement. Then you want to check the eyes for iritis and anterior which you see in 20% of patients. Check the heart for erotic regurgitation. And remember, the classic murmur there is an early diastolic murmur, which may radiate uh, parasternally to the right sternal border if there's root involvement, okay? And uh, this is seen in some 4% of patients who have had the disease for over 15 years. And remember that this has a huge eponymous parade, right? So you get the uh, Austin Flint murmur, the Mustard sign, um, you get Jerusalem sign, you get a white pass pressure, 
uh, collapsing pulse and a whole lot of other stigmata that happens with that. And also note con cardiac conduction defects. Uh, the lungs you examine for mild restrictive disease, apical fibrosis, apical cavities, and secondary fungal infection. Look for cyanosis, because patients with a rigid spine syndrome often have underlying hypoventilation. CNS involvement, for instance, uh, quadriplegia, etc., uh, or, or paraparesis as a result of quad equina syndrome, and the foot for Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis. All right. So in terms of the uh, diagnostic criteria of ankylosing spondylitis, right, um, it's the New York criteria of 1984, which states that we have definitive ankylosing spondylitis, which is present if we have the radiological criterion being associated with at least one clinical criterion. So the radiological criterion is sacroiliitis grade 2, or more bilaterally or grade three or four unilaterally together with at least one of the clinical criteria which is number one lower back pain and stiffness for longer than three months which improves with exercise but not yet relieved by rest that right? and number two is restriction of movement of the lumbar spine in both the sagittal and frontal planes number three restriction of chest expansion relative to normal values and correlated for age and sex yeah, how would you investigate someone in whom you suspect ankylosing spondylitis? You want to get an anterior posterior view of the sacroiliac joints and lateral radiographs of the lumbar spine. The earliest changes we note are erosions and sclerosis of the sacroiliac joints. Later in the disease process, we get our beloved syndesmophytes, which may be found in the lumbar sacral spine, and severe disease involving progresses up the spine, leading to a so called bamboo spine. All right. Um, all right, remember also that sacroiliitis is often seen in Reiter syndrome, which is reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile chronic arthritis, and intestinal arthropathy, which is enteropathic arthritis. How would you manage someone with X-Bond? So first up, encourage exercise, particularly physical therapy to preserve back extension. Consider physiotherapy referral. Then the use of non-steroidals, um, non-selective or COX-2 inhibitors are used. This is first line. And, uh, you know... However, for many uh, patients, this is the only treatment that is ever required. Other analgesia are not as effective as NSAIDs. However, they can be considered for residual pain despite continuous maximum treatment with NSAIDs. Salvastatin has some evidence in peripheral arthritis associated with Angspond, but there is no evidence for methotrexate in axial spine disease. Methotrexate use has shown no benefit in Angspond, either as monotherapy or in combination with other disease-modifying drugs. Right. The next um, agent we use is tumor necrosis factor, uh, antagonists, right? The likes of etanercept, adalimumab, infliximab, and golimumab. Anti TNF therapy uh, has been shown to improve disease activity, patient symptoms, as well as disease progression if treatment is started early enough in the disease process. We can also consider surgical therapy consisting of vertebral wedge osteotomy, which is occasionally indicated, and referral to ophthalmologist, of course, if you have anterior uveitis. Okay, guys, there we go. Ankylosing spondylitis and the 12 A's. God bless you.